National Prayer. Okay. Almighty and eternal God, who through Jesus Christ has revealed your glory to all nations, please protect and preserve Belize, our beloved country. God of might, wisdom, and justice, please assist our Belizean government and people with your Holy Spirit of counsel and fortitude. Let the light of your divine wisdom direct their plans and endeavors, so that with your help we may attain our just objective. With your guidance, may all our endeavors tend to peace, social justice, liberty, national happiness, the increase of industry, sobriety, and useful knowledge. We pray, O oh God of mercy, for all of us, that we may be blessed in the knowledge and sanctified in the observance of your most holy law, that we may be preserved in the union and in that peace which the world itself cannot give. And after enjoying the blessings of this life, please admit us, dear Lord, to that eternal reward that you have prepared for those who love you. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated as we now have the welcome address by Sister Tanya Flowers Gillett, President, BNTU Branch, Belize BNTU Branch. Good morning, Chair of the Commission, Chair Anthony Chinona, former Mayor of the City of Balbapan, Commissioners present, Commissioner Maria Zabani, and Chair of St. Catherine's Academy Board of Governors, Commissioner Ruth Schumann and BNTU's National President, Speaker Mr. Ed P. Usher, Mr. Darrell Bradley, Ms. Jamie Usher, 
Principal, Belize High School, BNTU National Treasurer, Sister Keisha Flower Williams, BNTU Belize Branch Executive Members, Deans, Administrators, Fellow Educators, and Invited Guests. I am pleased to welcome you all to today's dialogue on the People's Constitution. As the Holy Book posits that there is a time and place for everything, and indeed, fellow educators, it is time for a comprehensive review of the Constitution, our Constitution, that involves all of us. As these stakeholders in the field of education, it is fundamental for us to comprehend what these changes are and the outcomes as it pertains to every aspect of our lives. My fellow educators, I urge you today not to leave here with unanswered questions. Be active listeners, critical thinkers, engage in the dialogue, and voice your opinions respectfully. Finally, as we keep God as the center of this Constitution and our beloved nation, let's actively engage as we will have the final say. Once again, I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Tanya. We will now have the overview of the Constitution's Commission and the introduction of speakers by the, the Chair of the Commission, Mr. Anthony Chanona. Teachers, a very pleasant good morning. Thank you for making the effort to be here. I know we have teachers all the way from Kikaka and La Isla Bonita, San Pedro. Thank you. I will take a brief minute of your time to give you an overview of why you're here and why this partnership between the Belize Teachers Union the People's Constitution Commission, and the Ministry of Education. But before I give you that inter overview, I just wanted to give you a little analysis, synopsis of the two books you have in your hand. Began with this. This is the Constitution of Belize. It is 163 pages long. It has 43,495 words, and it has 13 chapters. This is the rule book of how we are governed. Governments have power that the people give them. The Constitution marries that power to justice. Without that delicate balance between justice and power is tyranny and no functioning democracy can exist when there's tyranny. It's a very important document. So what you have in your hands is a brief summary of 163 pages to 23 volume 1. Thanks to attorney at law Richard Dickey Bradley, who sat early one morning in his Sabbath, and we produced this booklet. We also had help from Professor Destro, Robert Destro, from the University of Columbia, along with Mr. Ed Usher, which is a section of our constitution in the preamble called Your Fundamental Rights. Mr. Usher will be presenting on this document. The Constitution begins with a preamble. Our Constitution, of, there's 194 countries that have adopted constitutions. Our Constitution, the preamble in our Constitution is considered to be one of the best in the world. But what does it do? The preamble sets out our identity as a people 
who we are, what we stand for, and what we will not stand for. It firmly establishes a bedrock. You see, when they're building houses in Belize, they drive a pile into the mud until it hits bedrock. Then you know your foundation of your house is sitting on rock. That is what the preamble does for our country. It establishes the supremacy of God. It establishes and affirms that all our laws, they can't hear me. All our laws are to be founded on spiritual and moral values. That is our constitution. Today's session then is an attempt of this PCC Ministry of Education BNTU lecture series to try to give you some knowledge of this constitution and I will be the first to admit not because I've appointed chairman automatically endows me with knowledge this is a very technical difficult book to understand and so as a commission we had to take almost seven months to try to understand what is in this book today's session is to try to have you follow the presentations that when you leave here you have some greater knowledge of how we are governed that in turn when you go back into your classrooms you can be able to empower your students a nation of students with the knowledge of their constitution will make for a better Belize. We're also hoping later in this month to produce a book, and maybe some of you all might remember this edition called How We Are Governed. We're going to be updating that booklet and with the Ministry of Education staff, reproduce it, and the idea is for the government to reintroduce that book as part of the education curriculum into the primary schools to teach, as I said, our students about the importance of the Constitution. We have two presenters that we are going to have address you today. Mr. Peter Ed Usher and Mr. Daryl Bradley. Mr. Usher will be speaking on the preamble and the fundamental rights. Mr. Bradley will be speaking on accountability and checks and balances. As Ms. Vanessa, Mistress of Ser Service, Ser Ministry, Minist Mistress of Ceremonies, my apologies, said, please try to pay attention because the questions will be taken in this afternoon's session, not after the presentation. So as you follow the presentation, make mental or written notes that you can participate this afternoon with asking your questions. That session this afternoon, which will begin at 1.15, will be moderated by Mr. Joshua Pop from the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He's not here yet, and Mr. Daryl Bradley will be joining us at 9.30. But what is very important, teachers, is that whenever we have an audience, we say a captive audience of the thousand plus teachers in a forum, we try to get data because not everyone gets up to use the microphone. But, but that does not take away from the fact that in your mind, you have a thought, you have a concern, and you have an opinion, but you might not get up and use the microphone. So we've designed what we call a citizen survey form. Volunteers will be passing around, and we are going to have internet released into the auditorium. You'll be asked to please scan this QR code, and what will pop up is a PCC citizen survey 
online question. It will take three minutes to participate in a survey. But the information you give us when you click goes directly to the Statistical Institute of Belize. That way, when you leave and go back into your homes and your community and your classrooms, we will be able to get a wider base of what you were thinking about regarding your constitution based on the questionnaire. There's a very important part of the questionnaire. It's called an open-ended questionnaire. It's not a choice. Please take the time to fill that out because that is truly one area we can consult. All the other areas is not consultation. It is basically testing your education on this issue. So please, while you may be required to, I'm asking you to please participate. This is our country. This is our constitution. And we want Belize to be a better place. I will end on this note. Mr. Price has been referred to George K Right Honorable George Cadle Price as the father of our nation. Along with others, he wrote in consultation with the people of Belize, the 1981 Belize Constitution. This year makes it 42 years old. And this is what Mr. Price had to say, and I quote, I believe that a country first duty is to set its own house in order. And having set its first house in order, it can then contribute better to the community and to the world. Instead of being a weak link we can become a strong link. Teachers, Belizeans all, let's rise to this challenge and write better our constitution. Thank you very much. I will now introduce Mr. Ed Peter Usher. Give me one second. Ed Peter Usher is a citizen of Belize. He's also a farmer, by the way. He's a graduate of Wesley College in Belize City and the Royal Military Academy in the United Kingdom. He holds a bachelor's degree in law from the University of Guyana and a master's degree of laws, legislative drafting from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, Barbados. Mr. Usher is an adjunct lecturer at Wesley Junior College in Belize City, where he lectures in public law, law, and legal systems, and also at Corozal Junior College, where he lectures in constitutional and public law, and law, and legal systems. Mr. Usher is married and has four children and resides in Belize City. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Ed Usher to the podium. Okay, good morning again, teachers. Just a quick little um, housekeeping. The teachers who are standing outside Please come inside, and the teachers who have a seat beside them, please raise your hand so the teachers could come in. Please come in, sit, and please give your undivided attention. Remember, when the information is being presented, please record questions that you would like to ask. There is a mic that is at the front and one at the back. When the question and answer session comes, you will line up and come to the mic and ask your questions. 
Um, the question and answer will be the second item after lunch. There was a little um, change in the order of ceremonies. So we'll have the debate after lunch, the debate presentation, and then the question and answer. So you will need to record your question and please pay attention as there will be prizes during this session. Um, teachers are also asked to do the survey. There are different stations for you to do the survey and the attendants will come to you for you to complete the survey or you can scan the QR code when you're told to do so. There's a survey to be completed today. So teachers, please be seated and let's give our presenters your undivided attention. Repeat after me. I am Belize. You are Belize. We are all Belize. Now can we have silence and undivided attention? Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buitibinafi. Yes, I am Ed Usher, and I am tasked with presenting to you on the preamble of the Constitution and fundamental rights. Now, what is the Constitution? The Constitution are the basic principles and laws of Belize, this nation state, that determines the powers and duties of the government and guarantee and protect the rights of the people living here in Belize. So that's a basic fundamental answer to what is the Constitution. The Belize Constitution, as you hear the chairman said, came to life on the 21st of September, 1981. It has 163 pages, 13 parts, 149 sections and four schedules. The preamble, what is the preamble? The preamble is basically the flowery part of the Constitution. It is those words at the beginning of the Constitution that says what are the dreams and aspirations of the Belizean people. And it includes, but it is not limited to, an, intro an introduction to what we want. It says that we affirm, for example, the supremacy of God. Note that you never say, Methodist God or Catholic God or Anglican God or what you perceive God to be, it says, acknowledges the supremacy of God. So nobody can quarrel about, oh well, I talk about which God did you talk about? The Muslim one, the Buddhist, the Hindu, it is speaking of your perception of God and it affirms the supremacy of God. It respects the principles of social justice. I saw many of you repeating the national prayer earlier, and you see the part that said, you came to the part that says, social justice, liberty, the increase of industry, sobriety, and useful knowledge. Not just knowledge, useful knowledge, knowledge, useless knowledge, but useful knowledge. The preamble continues to say the equal protection should be given to children regardless of their social status. Very interesting point here. 
Belize is a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children or the Rights of a Child. Back in the olden days, you used to have bastard children. If you're not born in a wedlock, you're the one bastard. Well, we sign on to the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of Children, which says that all children are to be treated equally. So, as we are a dualist system of governance and laws, we adopted that and we can see it in chapter 173 of the laws of Belize, the FACA or the Families and Children's Act, where it clearly states that all children will be treated equally. So our convention repeats that in the preamble. Another thing that I would like to point out, in the interest of time, I can't go through the entire preamble, but in 2001, the government amended the constitution, the preamble, to say the dignity and social and cultural values of Belizean, including Belizeans, sorry, including Belize's indigenous people. So the 1981 constitution did not have those words, but Belize saw the need to respect our indigenous peoples and as such, it says the cultural values of Belizeans, including Belize's indigenous peoples. Now, the next topic that I am supposed to discuss with you all is fundamental rights. But I believe, as I said to that massive crowd of teachers in Coroza last week, Friday, I say, well, we can't get big like that. But uno the get Coroza want to run for their money. So I'm happy to see all you teachers here today. But before we look at fundamental rights, I want to look at one section, if you permit me. The Supremacy Clause. Because the Supremacy Clause gives the Constitution its teeth. Without the su Supremacy Clause, you might as well tear it up and throw it away. So before we go to fundamental rights, and you will see the importance of fundamental rights presently. Now, what is the Supremacy Clause? The Supremacy Clause is easy to find in the Constitution. It is in Part 1. And Part 1 only got two sections. Section 1, which defines what Belize is, a sovereign independent state in the Caribbean, in Central America, democratic, etc. And then Section 2. That's it. So if you don't learn or listen to me and not move from there without anything today, move with that. Only two sections in a Part 1. And the important one is the Supremacy Clause. Now, why is the Supremacy Clause important? The Supremacy Clause states that this Constitution shall be the supreme law of Belize, and any other law that is inconsistent with this Constitution shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. Where are all the words there? One latter thing, the in a one sentence. Make we analyze it. Make we surgically dissect it. Kind of might sound like that us palabras, but let us look at it and dissect it. This constitution shall be the supreme law, I believe. That one they covered, no ambiguity there. And any other law, we have passed by any other law. Because your question might be, where does any other law come from? Well, if you go to section, if I remember correctly, section 68 of the Belize Constitution, it says that the government has the power to make laws for the peace, order, and good governance of this country. But the government can only make laws, obviously through the legislature. I know you teachers, and I won't bore you with this. You all are familiar with the three pillars 
or posts of government, the executive branch, which executes the law, the cabinet, commissioner of police, controller of customs, etc. That is the executive branch. And then you have the legislative branch. And the legislative branch legislates. They make the laws. And then the third branch of government, or the third pillar of government, the judicial branch. And the judicial branch does what? It interprets the law, or it says what the law is. So what does supremacy and any other law has to do with it? Once the legislative branch makes a law, it cannot make a law that abridges, contradicts, contravenes, abrogates, gevex with, cuts out the Constitution. It has to be in line with the Constitution. So this Constitution shall be the supreme law, I believe, no ambiguity, and any other law, we know where they come from, that contravenes this Constitution, that law shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. Well, pause there again. So where a piece of legislation contravenes the Constitution, that not the whole law will get through out. That's why it says that other law shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, just the inconsistency, so if the one section out of the law inconsistent, well, that's the section we're going. We're going to get surgically removed. If there are 17 words, then they're going. So you don't want to throw out the whole, like where they say the proverbial baby with the bathwater. Just that area of it that is unconstitutional. And an example of that would be the Unibam case, for example, where the then Chief Justice Kenneth Benjamin surgically removed a portion of the criminal code, chapter 101 of the laws of Belize at section 53. He surgically removed just a portion of it to bring it in line with the Constitution. So I thought that I had to touch on the supremacy clause because after this now, the smooth sailing. So we are now at the substantive area that I am to discuss, which is your fundamental rights. Your fundamental rights are your God-given rights, are those rights that are to be inalienable. You cannot alienate yourself from those rights. They can't take them away. They could reduce them, they could minimize them, but they can't take them away. And those rights are found in part two of the Belize Constitution between, or no, sorry, section 3 to 19. If you go to section 20, it says, when we get there, I'll deal with that. But just remember, sections 3 to 19, those are your fundamental rights. Section 3 says, and from the beginning, from the outset, I want to see that rights or with rights comes limitations. With rights come certain limitations. No right is absolute. I think only one, through my study of the Constitution, only one might be deemed to be unlimited, and that is your right not to be forced into servitude. No slavery. And I don't, I don't recall seeing any another thing. When you read the Constitution, I want you all, when you're reading the Constitution or any piece of legislation for that matter, you must look for these words, notwithstanding, subject to, provided that, shall not be deemed to be in contravention. When you say notwithstanding, pause, pause, look upon it, because it, it does something. Subject to, it does something. It's limiting. It's limiting the right to a certain extent. We'll get to that presently. So these fundamental rights between from 3 to 19 and section 3 does the introduction of your rights. And it says, these fundamental rights include the right to life, liberty, 
security of the person and the protection of the law, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression and of assembly and association and protection for your family life, personal privacy, privacy of your home and other property, and the recognition of your human dignity and the protection from arbitrary deprivation of your property. These are the for basic fundamental rights that Section 3 introduces. Now, I said to you earlier that your rights are not limitless, are not absolute. When I was reading for my master's, I had one of the greatest legal minds in the Caribbean as it relates to constitutional law, Professor Carnegie. Unfortunately, I don't know if I do some kind of bad thing, but as it don't teach me, the man passed away. So while I was in Barbados, I had to go to the funeral, but one of the most brilliant constitutional professors in the Commonwealth Caribbean. He said, look at it like this. Your right to, to throw a punch and when my nose begin. Unless, unless we, I signed a waiver in a boxing, then you could beat me till you half kill me. But feeling that your right to throw a punch and when my nose begin, you have to respect my rights. And that is what section three says. It says, you have these rights, but subject to, remember those words? Subject to the rights of others, to the public health, and to, na pub and to national security. Those will be some exceptions to those rights. So let look at, let's look at your freedom of expression. People say, me got my, me got my um, freedom of speech, boss. Okay, I agree, you got freedom of speech. But your freedom of speech is not absolute. You can't say anything you want about me and a lie. Because I'm a carrier of quote, Mr. Bradley will represent me, and I'll get easy money. And when you pass on, I say, this guinea is the for you. So you can't go say anything you want about people in a derogatory fashion and a lie. If that's true, well, I'm going to lock my tail and I'm going to haul on my corner. But you cannot go into, somebody can holler in the state right in this auditorium right now. Fire, 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 and no fire no there. People they scramble through. Somebody get mashed, somebody get trampled and dead. And then when you are arrested by the police, but by my constitution right to freedom of speech, it's not limitless. You have certain limits that are required, necessary limits. The next one is the freedom of conscience. And under the freedom of conscience, you have your right to your religion. And the Constitution says it clearly. It says at section 11, you have the freedom of a religion. You have the freedom to change your religion. You have the freedom to propagate your religion. And you have the freedom to go back to your religion when you don't left it. If they accept you, of course, you could go back to your religion. You have the freedom not to make a note. You don't have to swear. I was a magistrate for 15 years. And when somebody come in, the Mennonites specifically say, Your Honor, one thing, when I say, take the Bible in your right hand, the man say, Your Honor, with due respect, I know swear. I don't make oath. So then they are allowed by the Constitution to make an affirmation to say, here we go on, boss. Me no swear, but I promise and I affirm that the thing where I want to say today, that the whole truth, okay, straight. And then other persons can swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God, they have that option. But the Constitution said that you can't compel somebody to make an oath. Another thing, you cannot compel a person to be a witness against himself. You can't compel somebody to be one witness against your own self. When you allege the police, the prosecution, that you must prove, are you not only for prove, 
you must prove beyond a reasonable doubt and it continues and where there is a reasonable doubt the benefit of that doubt goes to the accused the man who you bring there are only in rare circumstances where the person who is accused must prove certain things another one of your right and this one interesting I did digress but interesting a lot of people say boss I got a right for vote am I right and I champion the right to vote well surprise surprise the right to vote is not a fundamental right someone will look for me like you're half crazy no I know half crazy where are your fundamental rights found section 3 to 19 where is your right to vote from section 92 if your fundamental rights are between 3 and 19 where the right to vote they don't wait at section 92 that's the first one when you come out you are born when you are born you have the as a matter of fact catholic and other stringent people believe from conception you have the right to life so let's say from then you have the right to life when you have the right to vote when you're 18 where the fundamentality are that day as soon as you're born or as soon as you conceive depends on who the think talk about it you have the right to life you have the right to vote as your ban or one or two no you have the right to vote when you're 18 then you have certain other conditions precedent to this fundamental right to vote which we believe some of us believe you have to be 18 you have to register you have to register at the area where you live and you only can vote in that area I rest my case it is a right but to my mind it's an acquired right after having satisfied certain conditions precedent Freedom of movement, section 10 of the Belize Constitution. When I was in Corozal, not last week Friday with teachers, when I was presenting to the general audience on the 29th of July at 3 o'clock, somebody said to me, Mr. Osha, I got a problem. You know. I said, make a hear it and see if I could help. Because I was just a student of the Constitution myself. He said, if we have freedom of movement in this country, I say, yes, Section 10 guarantees you the freedom and protects the freedom of movement. How come I can't get up the cross and I just go to the free zone? <laughs> I, say, I say, well, well, remember what I said in the beginning, no right absolute. The Constitution says for national security reasons, for health reasons, your freedom of movement may be curtailed or restricted. He said, matters then. He said, sure. So the Constitution go one right with one hand and take weight with the next. I said, no, really. It just limited. It just partially take weight, if you want to call it that. But you see how people, if you got the freedom of movement, where to go on with that? The freedom of owning your property and not being deprived of that property without a line place to organize it and without proper compensation. One guy, that is about the seventh presentation of the MEC, July the 7th, Belmopan, and then the prison on the 21st of July, and then the 28th of July, Orangewa, 29th of July, Corozal. 12th of August, Creole Council, 25th of um, last week, Friday, 25th, 25th of August, Corozal, BNTU. So, that kind of question come up. One of them, one of them say, Mr. Osha, what about property? The protection of my rights to my property? I say, yes, you have a right to your property, and you have it, you have a right to own your property, but the government can deprive you of the property, not arbitrarily. I'm going to take your land and I'll give me Bali. No, 
You can't take my land for give your body. That's arbitrary. Boy, Mr. Osha, we need your land because we want to put one of these small library and one post office. Well, then, of course, where I could do, you have to adequately compensate me for it. Again, there is no absolute. Mr. Darrell Bradley could tell you in a property law, you have certain interests in the property. And the one where we say, I own my land, that is the fee simple, absolute in possession. But even with that one, the title where I own my land, you want to know who really owns the land? No pay your taxes, your land tax to city council and left it dilapidated for some years. And who will come for it? City council? If you can't pay your tax, that one get action off. So who own it? At the end, the state, we own one interest in our property. But one good thing about the Constitution as it relates to property, it explains, because somebody said, well, if I got protection of my right to my property, how come the government could take tax out of it and social security? Because, again, that is one of those subject to, subject to, or that is those, one of those notwithstandings. Notwithstanding this A, B, C, D. Another question that came up on one of those occasions was during COVID, Mr. Osha, the lack we don't uh, deprive we of freedom of movement. That may be unconstitutional. I said, no. Why? Because the Constitution said, for the purposes of health and public safety, the government can enact certain laws. So then, those laws cannot be unconstitutional. Our next one, our next issue that arose was a fellow stood up. He might have been a student of the law, like myself, and he said, this was when I was presenting to the Creole Council on 12th of August, and he said, Mr. Osho, so he stand up now, and for his stance, I said, boy, I have to tighten up. Come up the loan, seriousness not for his face and thing. And he stand up by the mic and he said, Mr. Osho. And I said, yes. And he said, you know whether the basic, basic um, structure principle? And I said, yes, I have an understanding of it. He said, well, under the basic structure principle, how come government could amend the constitution here and amend it there and amend it in another way? And I said, well, the basic structure principle came up by Chief Justice Abdullah Conte in the Barry Boeing case as it related to royalty. Things that are found like if oil get fine under your land, will you forget? Well, Barry Boeing and the group and, and the others won, but the basic structure principle that came out as a part of the racial decedendi or the reason for the decision of the judge was chastised because parliament amended section two of the Belize constitution to include a subsection two which says and i'm paraphrasing here that once you carry out the proper procedures and processes that are found in section 69 of the Constitution which deals with alterations that shall never be deemed to be unconstitutional. Look out for the word deem. That word deem interesting. Why? Because as I learned in my legislative drafting masters, the word deem creates a legal fiction. Where that Mr. Osha? It deem the E E M creates a legal fiction why because it makes something is which never was what do you mean by that explain further okay for example the regulations um the 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 pilotage regulations or no the marine the um water taxi regulations which i drafted the amendments for um for the Belize Port Authority, where I'm the legal officer. My master's, as Mr. Chanona said, is in legislative drafting, writing laws that are my thing. So the word deem 
we may want the law go back to a certain time frame for some reasons which I shall not disclose at this moment but we wanted the law to go back and so when the law came into effect today to say the law came into a period before we had to deem it and deem creates what a legal fiction and so how does it work you look at the wording and it says this these regulations shall be deemed to have come into effect on June the 1st this is August the 29th so even though it's signed today it come in June 29th now you might say but Mr. Usher in a section 5 he say of the Constitution he say you cannot make laws to be retrospective but there's a word where we miss and the word say the government shall not make any law that creates a criminal offense which at the time when the offense or the omission occurred it was not at that time the law but that is in criminal offenses this act shall be deemed to have come into effect at this time as long as it does not create a criminal offense then it can be retrospective you can't have rules against retrospectivity and one final thing as it really we got 10 all right i got 10 minutes i hope i'm not boring you all i find the law fascinating i don't know about uno but i hope you all find it in a similar fashion one more piece of advice as it relates to reading laws because you all will go back and read the constitution when you see the word shall it is mandatory you have to do it when you see the word may it's discretionary right when you see the word and it means tuare when you see the word er in a law it means take your pick but what if you see the word and with one comma front of it then that becomes one or but i don't know why one draftsman or a put one comma front of one and when you go easily say or for example rice and beans that are the sunday rice and beans mix up when you say rice comma and beans it's two beans and rice it is it is not conjunctive it is disjunctive section 6 deals with the protection of the law it says that everyone in Belize note note because words have meanings in law every person section 3 say it every person in Belize what are the difference because when you go to section 92 that gives your right to, to vote it says every citizen every person includes the citizen and one visitor one tourist and they also include um, persons where they are illegally or undocumented we have to be politically correct now the only days will say illegal alien you'll get away with that now you have to say um, undocumented immigrant you can't go say you can't go say illegal alien that is offensive so it says so you have to look for every person every citizen some you might overlook it you might say oh in your mind your brain might say that the same thing but they're not the same thing because every person in Belize can vote but every person in Belize have the protection as it relates to the fundamental rights in the Constitution and finally one of my students said to me Mr. Usher all of this rights bit from section 3 to 19 then there are those again loan words in a palabras and I what happened Mr. Usher if somebody violates one of my fundamental rights well I guided him to section 20 section 20 is in part 2 
and section 20 says words to the effect and I'm paraphrasing if any person any person no citizen any person alleges that any of his constitutional rights has been is being or is likely to be abridged, abrogated, contravened, violated, cursed out. That person may apply to the, well, not Supreme Court anymore, to the High Court for redress. A few pointers in at that. Where a person alleges, you don't have to prove, it just co allege it. Where a person allege that a constitutional right has been violated, is being in the present violated or is likely to be in the future to, let's say one law come out and the man say boy in the future i believe that this law will affect me then you can go to the supreme court who or the high court sorry who is the jealous guardian of the constitution to say if this law right can this law might violate my right not necessarily today maybe not tomorrow or next week but next month or in the future it can violate my right and so i want the, the supreme court or the high court to find this piece of legislation to be unconstitutional so the constitution is not toothless section 2 tells you that it is toothless if you do not understand it and you can't blame people according to the chairman there was a poll taken and it said that 98 percent of the belizean people no know where the end of the constitution that is absolutely alarming but you can't blame the people when you open the constitution and you see words like caring before and here to four and whereas when i studied drafting legislative drafting they said write in a simple english not write in an archaic language but back in 1981 when they drafted the first one liars more make our money Li i mean the liars help draft it and just try one mic because they say you're having an echo okay let's try one. okay so we're gonna try one mic uh, we have one echo yes so under um, the 198, where was I? Sorry, 1981 Constitution, as it related to, they are give somebody a prize. Okay, but I was just saying that under the 1981 Constitution, it was drafted by attorneys, by lawyers, and so they use legalese. But now we are trying, and hopefully, if we amend the Constitution, if that is the choice of the Belizean people. I'll make I just finish. They're going to jeep where they block somebody. And I'm almost done. Just give me one more minute. And so, we perhaps, if they are going, if you all decide what will be in the next constitution, if it will be amended or it remain the same, you just want to make a few changes. Perhaps making the words in the constitution simple language. So that, like Bob Marley said, that even the babe and the suckling will be able to understand this document, this most important document, the Belize Constitution. I want to say thank you for your attention. My time is up. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Usher. Before we continue, the owner of C64907, a green Jeep, please um, move your vehicle. It's, in, it's disrupting the traffic that needs to bring the food. And teachers, again, I remind you, if you're outside, please come inside. There are seat chairs at the front or teachers that have a chair beside them at the back just raise your hand so that the teachers can be seated
Mr. Usher said a word just now that it means mandatory. So I'll use the word shall, right? Okay. The teachers in this building should that attend this event shall be registered. And if you're not registered, you will not get your food. So you need to register to get your ticket. The teachers, please be registered. Ensure that you are registered. The attendants will just raise your hand and then you register and they will get a red ticket and a white ticket for your food and drink. So please ensure that you're registered. We now move to the next section of this program. Our next speaker will be Mr. Darrell Bradley presented by the chair. Thank you once again, Mistress of Ceremonies. Just before I introduce our next speaker, Mr. Daryl Bradley, I want to thank you. I see the QR codes are being scanned and that you are responding. Thank you. I also wanted to mention that you will notice in Dickie Bradley's book, a brief summary of the Constitution, which is a 23-page reduced version in simple language of the 163, highlighted in yellow is a section marked Food for Thought. There are some questions. You can look at those questions, and some of these can help you as you process today's proceedings. Daryl Bradley is a Belizean attorney at law and a partner in the Bradley Ellis Law Firm. He served as a past president of the Belize Senate, chairman of the Social Security Appeals Tribunal. Daryl teaches part-time at the University of the West Indies Open Campus at the University and the University of Belize. He also served as mayor of Belize City and was the president during that time of the Mayor's Association of Belize. Mr. Bradley holds a bachelor's degree in sociology and international studies and a master's degree in public administration and a postgraduate certificate in teaching from St. Louis University in the United States. He earned a bachelor's degree in law from the University of the West Indies, Norman Manley Law School, and a certificate of legal education. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in joining in welcoming Mr. Daryl Bradley to the podium. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I first want to say how grateful I am to have been given this opportunity to give my comments and insights on the Constitution, specifically in relation to the issue of accountability and how the Constitution seeks to achieve that. Before I go into the body of the presentation, I just want to thank the chair and thank the commission for the great work that they're doing. Any change in our society has to be led by people, and it has to be sparked by meaningful public consultations and engagement with people. And I really appreciate the commission for initiating these processes. I cannot tell you the last time I have seen so many Belizeans gather together under the ages of any organization to talk about any law or policy in Belize, and this as so significant and important as the Belize Constitution. The issue of accountability is fundamental because we want to understand not only what is the Constitution, but what 
is it meant to do? Mr. Usher went through the fundamental rights in the Constitution. And the rights exist, and those rights give people in Belize a certain quality of life, a certain enjoyment. But fundamentally, the Constitution is a piece of paper. Those rights are written on paper. Those rights take action, they take color, they take energy and spirit from the people. The Constitution is the people, and the Constitution is given life by the people. And so the Constitution does two important things. One is the Constitution contains the principles laws and rules by which our society and our country is governed. The second thing the Constitution does is what my presentation is about. That the Constitution creates a mechanism that is self-executing, that preserves and protects those rights, and that ensures that those rights are given expression and life. So let's place this into context. Belize became independent in 1981. And Belize's constitution is borrowed from other constitutions that predate ours. And these constitutions came into existence because people at those instances we're saying that we want the rights by which our society is governed written down. In those societies at that time, you had very autocratic and oppressive government. And they said, we want change. We want the principle of the rule of law, that we're not ruled by any particular government or any particular king, or any particular queen, or any particular ruler. We want to be governed by written rules and laws and principles that apply to everybody, that apply to the leader and the citizen equally, and that are actionable and enforceable. So what the Constitution did, and what our Constitution does, is that it creates a system of checks and balances. The Constitution, in order for it to work, has to contain a system of effective checks and balances. There is this saying that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That is true. And that has been true for the last 10,000 years of human civilization. That whenever entities have power, they tend to abuse it. And what the Constitution is intended to do is to be a living, breathing document that creates effective checks and balances, that protects the right of the people against the right of the state. So the first way that the Constitution does this is by this principle called the rule of law. And that is achieved, as Mr. Usher said, because the Constitution itself says that it's the supreme law. The Constitution is the supreme law, and no other law shall stand that is inconsistent with the Constitution. What does that mean? If a law is passed that does not accord with your rights, that law will be struck down because the Constitution creates the rule of law, that we will be a rule of law society, that rights and laws govern equally and to everyone, including the government, including the state, and including all citizens. 
The next fundamental principle of the Constitution is this notion of separation of powers. You will hear that word repeatedly, and some of you who teach history or civics may teach it in your class. So before the Constitution, what we had is that government was concentrated in one entity. At that time, it may have been a king or a queen. And what the Constitution did literally is that it destroyed that power. And it separated that constitutional central power into three branches of government. So before the Constitution, you had centralized government. What the Constitution does fundamentally as a fundamental check and balance is that it divided the power of the state into three separate, equal, and balancing branches of government. So for those of you who teach civics, you will call this the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. That is a fundamental principle of the Constitution, that the branches of government are separate, and the branches of government act as a watchdog and a check and balance on the other branches of government. So that if you are upset with a law, you do not like a law in Belize, you go to the judiciary, and the judiciary can strike down that law. Likewise, if you do not like an action of the executive branch, you go to the vote, and you can vote for or against the government. The three branches of government create checks and balances against the other branches of government. The problem, I believe, in our constitution is that there are not sufficient checks and balances. And the way that our constitution is structured creates too much power in one branch of government. It creates too much power in the central government, in the executive branch of government. So if you look at the judges, who ultimately gets to decide on the judges? The executive branch. If you look at the legislative branch, who makes up the legislative branch? Those who dominate the executive branch. So the point that I would argue, and I would ask you to consider, is that there is a fundamental flaw in our constitution. And that flaw is that there is not efficient and effective systems of checks and balances. Because the central government, by the text of the constitution and by our practice and convention, has been allowed to balloon into a powerful branch of government and they have overshadowed the other branches of government and that results in a system of inadequate checks and balances. And this is an important point because if you do not have checks and balances, all the rights that Mr. Usher talked about would only be rights on paper. The type of society that we want to live in, the principle of the rule of law, the dignity of human beings, the expression of the will of the people, those things will not exist unless we effectively control the governmental structure. And when I say this, I'm not speaking about any one government. I am making a structural point that the structure of our government has a flaw. We in Belize have been battling this issue of corruption and governmental abuse since independence. And we have been battling this issue from both governments and both political parties. And the problem is our system of government. Our system of government does not promote adequate checks and balances. There is a saying that good men and good women make good laws, 
but good laws do not make good men and women. So we can have a perfectly drafted constitution. We can provide all the rights that we want. We can say that every Belizean citizen will be given a check for $50 million from the government of Belize. But we will never enjoy those rights. We will never enjoy the idea of a Belizean utopia unless the structure of our government, unless the structure of the constitution is aligned to a way that promotes those rights. So that one of the things that I would impress upon you is that this consultation process is about you. It is about the type of society that you want and that you envision. But in order for that to be realized, the structure of our government has to be conducive to bringing about that realization. And if we have limited checks and balances, we will never realize the dream of a better Belize. The dream of what the Constitution is meant to achieve the dignity and worth of the individual where every Belizean has equal opportunity and they can thrive within society. So when you look at the Constitution, in the Constitution itself, those who drafted it designed it so that no one entity would have power. And if you can look at the Constitution in terms of the Belize Constitution, there are checks and balances. Number one, the most fundamental checks and balance in the Constitution is the vote, the electoral process, the fact that every five years or less, citizens get to elect their government. One of the things that I would ask you to reflect on is that we in Belize, we have corrupted that process we have corrupted the electoral system. We have corrupted it to the point where vote buying is widespread. We have corrupted it to the point where our public discussion and dialogue are not about policies that move our country forward, but it's about who have more money and who is more popular and who is able to put forward more things that in a, entice people to vote. It is not about the spirit of what the Constitution is intended to do, that is to promote meaningful dialogue about policies that move our people forward. You can look at every example of electoral reform that has transpired since 1981 to today's date, including mandatory redistricting, including re-registration, all of those processes that are built into the law to act as a check and balance have been corrupted. And if you have an ineffective electoral system, you can never ever have a good government because people are not voting for what they ought to vote for. They're voting for an expectation that does not exist. So if somebody gives you a hundred dollars for your vote, you will get a government that is worth one hundred dollars. The second example of a check and balance that is built into the constitution is the public service. The public service is a constitutionally entrenched body. The public service is referred to in the Constitution and it is given protection in the Constitution. The public service regulations are a schedule to our Constitution. And the reason why the public service is constitutionalized is because the public service is a guardian of the people. The public service is a check and balance on the political power. So if I am a mayor, 
if I am a area representative and I become a minister, I am only there for five years. But the public servant is the technical staff that is there for life, that carries the institutional knowledge, the technical knowledge, the foundation of the service, and that executes the policy that is designed by the elected official. The public service is entrenched, and public officers are to be protected. If you look at the UNCAC, the United Nations Corruption, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, we think about corruption as bribing a politician. That's part of it, but that's not what the UNCAC talks about. One of the first things that the United Nations Convention Against Corruption talks about is a merit-based public service. You don't hear anybody talking about that, but that is a major part of UNCAC. That's one of the first provisions that are mentioned in there, that public officers, teachers, police officers, governmental officials must be hired based on merit. And again, since our independence, since 1981 to 2023, we have corrupted and eroded the public service. So that what has occurred is that we have politicized the public service. If you want a job in the public service, bring one letter from your A representative. That is the height of being fundamentally wrong. The idea with the public service is that the public servant never has to answer to the elected official. The Constitution designed it that way and designed it that the public servant is independent of the political process. That is why a public servant is not hired by any minister. You're hired by the Public Service Commission and you're given tenure meaning that you can't be fired unless for cause. That's in the Constitution. Why? Because the Constitution recognizes that the political directorate may want to manipulate the public servant. And so whenever we undermine those systems, whenever we have policies and practices in place that weaken the public service, for example, the prevalence of contract officers. That is something that the Constitution does not mention. The Constitution says that you will have the elected official and you will have the public servant. And we may have open vote workers. But now in our public service and the governmental apparatus, there is a proliferation of contract officers and that undermines the effectiveness of the Constitution. So that if I'm the public officer and I'm responsible for implementation, but a contract officer tells me the minister said this, the minister said that, that is a system that could never work. So that this proliferation of contract officers is against the constitutional protection that is enshrined in the Constitution. I'll give you an example of an opinion that I share. Many years ago, we have a system of permanent secretaries. It exists in many other countries. And the permanent secretary is a person who is a career public officer. And that permanent secretary rises up into the ranks of the public service. And when the minister is elected, you meet that permanent secretary there. And when the minister is no longer in office, you leave that permanent secretary there. And that permanent secretary is the head of the ministry or the department or the statutory body. That person is the administrative head. What have we done? We have removed the permanent secretary, which is the chief administrative officer, and we've replaced that with a political appointee. 
we've replaced that with a contract officer that comes in with the minister, does the minister's bidding, and leaves with the minister. How can you have an efficient public service when the head of the public service is not from the public service? You will never be successful in a situation like that. I want to be very deliberate and cautious here that the comments that I'm making are weaned from my years of observation in government, both as a lawyer, both as a politician, both as a governmental officer. So I've seen the workings of government. And I will confess that these irregularities and these actions have been perpetuated by every political party in our society. The problem is that we have structural challenges to our system of government. And the only way that those things will change is if we make structural changes to our system of government. Ensure that our public service is given the autonomy and power and protection that the Constitution envisioned that it be given. Ensure that the electoral process and the vote is entrenched and protected so that when you have any irregularities in the electoral process, that will be dealt with seriously in accordance with law. You will look right now at the United States and you will see the case that is being brought against their former president about tampering with the electoral process. And the reason that case is so important is because they recognize how fundamental the electoral process is to the achievement of any right in the democracy. So that the right to life, the right to freedom of conscience, the right to free expression, none of those rights will be realized unless the system of government is operationalized in a way that would give expression to those rights. What I want to do in terms of my presentation is to highlight certain areas that I think needs to be looked at and certain areas that need to be reformed. Number one, I think that our constitution creates a wrong notion and concept of what government is. The Constitution says that government is essentially the central government. There is a part of the Constitution that talks about the executive branch of government. And it creates the executive branch of government as essentially the government. One of the challenges that I have with that is that that is not inclusionary. And we have different branches and forms of government in Belize that are not given expression in the Constitution. So why is it that we have a dominant central government? We have a dominant central government because the Constitution gives prominence to the central government. It talks about the central government as the dominant branch of government. When you look at the reality of Belizean life, we have local government, we have municipalities, we have mayors and town councils and city councils, we have village councils. The majority of Belizeans, about half of our population, 50%, live in villages. There is nowhere in the actionable section of our constitution that it talks about municipal government. It does not give the right of people who live in their communities to decide what happens to them in their communities. So that if I live in Pachacan, if I live in San Roman, what protections do I have that the assets within my community, the land, and the resources within my community will go towards the benefit of my community. None. You have situations in other countries like the United Kingdom where the central government in the past got rid of local government by one law. They just got rid of local government 
because local government was acting as an increased check and balance. In my experience as a mayor of Belize, there is oftentimes a friction between the local government and the central government, and the local government doesn't have adequate resources. Property taxes and trade license can't fix streets that people would want. So that one of the things that I would say is that our constitution needs to be more inclusive in the definition of what government actually is that government is not just the central government, that it includes the multiplicity of governments that do work in the society. And if you give expression to that in the constitution, what you will do is that you will raise the caliber of leadership in Belize. When I was mayor, I saw that there was a tremendous amount of leadership potential at the local government level. But that leadership potential was stifled because you have limited resources. And the public in cities and towns have big expectations. We did streets in Belize City, but everybody wanted their street. We just didn't have the resources. Mr. Mayor, you're doing a bad job because you're not building my street. How are you supposed to satisfy that expectation? And what I'm saying is that if the Constitution reflects the multiplicity of what government actually is, we would have more inclusion in the decision-making process. A corollary to this is inclusion of social partners. Social partners are included in the Constitution by virtue of the Senate. They are social partner senators. But I would argue that there needs to be more expression on the importance of social partner involvement in the Constitution, in the preamble, in the operative sections of the Constitution, and in the structure of the bodies of the Constitution. So in my view, the preamble should refer to the fact that government is the people. The U.S. Declaration of Independence says that we, the people, our constitution and our preamble needs to say that government of Belize is the people. And we would include social partner involvement in the decision-making process so that the recognition that unions have an important place to pay in the decision-making process that religious organizations and institutions of faith have an important role to play, that NGO communities have an important role to play, so that we will, as a society, make them members of the Senate, but that is not enough. When a decision is made, it is made usually only by the executive branch of government. And it's only at the back end that social partners have their involvement. I'll give you an example of where I was very impressed with social partner involvement, the marijuana legislation. That law was drafted. It was discussed in cabinet. It was presented to the House of Representatives. It was debated in the House of Representatives. It passed the House of Representatives so that it went 80% of the legislative process. And it, when it came to the Senate, the social partners said, no way. And the social partners blocked that piece of legislation to the point where that is no law in our country. The social partners said that we are not satisfied that this law is for the best interest of our Belizean people. They stopped the law. That is something, in my opinion, that I've never seen in this country. And that recognizes the power of social partner input. One of the things that I will put to you, though, is why is it that the debate the consultation, the involvement with social partners only became meaningful at the Senate. Why is it that that law was drafted, that law went to cabinet, 
that law went to the House of Representatives. It was read three times in the House of Representatives, and there was no meaningful consultation in relation to that law during all of that process. It is because our attitude of government is the central government. When we make law culturally and attitudinally, we do not believe that we need to have mass consultations. Not about the Constitution, but about every law. Every law in this country should involve meaningful public consultations because the law is about the people. It is about you and your rights. So that I would ask you to consider this. The PCC is doing an impressive job in relation to public consultation. When have you, as a teacher's union and body, as a large gathering as this, as people who are guardians of our education and our youth, as people who yourselves are educated and play an important role in discussion, consultation, and dialogue, when have you been consulted about a law as in-depth as this? And what I would say is that that needs to be the ethos of our legislative process. That needs to be how we carry on business in Belize, that when we make decisions that impact people, there needs to be meaningful public consultation, not only about the Constitution, but about the plenitudes of laws that we pass in our country. And it should not be something that we make law too quickly. Many times when the National Assembly makes a law, they have the three readings in one day. So they would make a law and they would pass that law in one day. The majority of our people don't know about those laws. And many of these laws are very, very important. And so what I'm saying is that when we talk about government and when we give expression in the Constitution about bodies and institutions, we have to reflect the principle of inclusivity and to recognize those bodies that play an important role in national life, unions, environmental groups, local government, organizations of faith that give expression. So in my experience dealing with unions and dealing with institutions of faith and NGO organizations, you engage with them at the back end, and it comes across as a fight. The unions are fighting with the government over the passage of a law. No, the law must be passed in a consultative, collaborative way. And just because I am the leader, it doesn't mean that I make the decision. It means that I am a facilitator of the democratic process. It means that I am the chief communicator and engager and convener of meaningful public consultations. That is the spirit of our constitution and that needs to be reflected in the text of our constitution. The recognition of these other bodies. The second important thing that I think we need to do is we need to reform the electoral process. And this has to be a detailed, meaningful reform. So for example, in Belize, currently, there are no laws that regulate political parties, none whatsoever, no law. There are no laws that regulate campaign finance, no laws exist that do that. There are laws on the books that regulate the conduct of public officials, but oftentimes those laws are not effectively enforced. So if I'm the government, we have a integrity commission. The law for the integrity commission is good, but all I have to do is not fund them. So I pass the budget. The law on other commissions are good, but all I have to do is not appoint the members. So that for a long time, we used to bring cases before the Public Service Commission, and the response was, there are no members because the government hasn't appointed it. 
So you undermine the check and balance by just not doing what you're supposed to do. And what I'm saying is that when you look at the Constitution and when you look at this reform process, do not only look at the language of the Constitution because words can be prettied up. I can make a word look pretty and I, talk, I can talk about the dignity and rights of human beings. I can talk about the spirit of our laws, but none of those things will be realized unless we give attention to the structure of the Constitution. We give attention to the institutions that are charged with giving effect to those rights, because unless we do those things, those rights will not exist. So there has to be deliberate, substantive and detailed reform as to our electoral process. So the law says that you have to do redistricting a certain amount of time. The law actually says that. And that law was just changed by the government at that time. The law was just changed. So we won't do the redistricting according to what the law says. We'll change it so that it's gonna be longer. And the idea with redistricting is that the principle of one man or one woman and one vote is fundamental. So in Belize City, you have certain constituencies that only have 3,000 votes. In the outer districts, Stan Creek, Toledo, Cayo, you have constituencies that have 8,000 votes. That is not one person, one vote. A vote in a constituency in Belize City does not weigh the same as a vote that is out district, 3,000 to 8,000. And that's fundamentally wrong because when you talk about making laws and when you talk about the distribution of resources and representative democracy, it gives certain areas more representation. And there's a reason why the Constitution says that that has to be done in a timely manner. Because people die, people move. People may move from Belize City to Cairo, from Cairo to Belize City, and you always have to make sure that those things are managed. But if I am the government and I could say, okay, well, I won't do that, I just won't do it, then you can never have good government. You can never have accountability and you can never have the rights that the Constitution says unless you safeguard the system. So individuals in our society had to go to court and commence litigation about that to ensure that that redistricting exercise was meaningfully carried out. Re-registration likewise. The law says that every so often, every individual has to re-register in their electoral division because again, we move. Those processes are fundamental, but if we allow those processes to be corrupted, then the system will not work. One suggestion that I will have is that the electoral commission needs to be more inclusive the electoral commission only includes the political parties. So we've allowed political parties to determine the conduct of the election. And if I am the fox and you ask me to guard the cheese, I will guard it in a way that I maximize my own benefit. And so the changes that are meaningful do not benefit the institution. So they will never change it. One of the things that can be done in the reform process is to recommend that the constitutionally entrenched electoral commission and other statutory commissions have inclusive representation. They include the unions. They include social partners, teachers, NGO communities, persons of faith. So that, for example, if you sat on the electoral commission and there was a proposal to extend the time for doing the redistricting, you would be that check and balance and you would say, hell no. And you would then go back to your union people and say, look, this is a proposal and we don't think that that is in our best interest and you would take to the streets. 
The point that I'm saying is that these reforms can be meaningful and they're done in other countries. I've observed elections in other countries and I've seen electoral bodies that have 15 members that involve social partners, that involve other checks and balances, because you want your electoral process to be transparent and to be correct. There's a reason why public officers manage elections, because the thinking is that the public officer is independent and autonomous, but the policy-making body has to determine the electoral laws in a way that is consonant with transparency as well. So that many of those bodies likewise can be inclusive to have representation from other social partner entities. Another comment that I would have, and these are only things that you may want to consider. When you're dealing with the electoral process, you may want to put in your constitution or you may want to consider term limits many countries central governments and local governments have term limits for elected officials what is a term limit a term limit says that a person can only hold an office for a maximum of a certain amount of years the president of the united states can only be president for two terms eight years People in municipal government in certain states of the United States can only hold that office for two terms. In our society, we've allowed people to be an elected official for 30 years. And in my view, this is a view that you don't have to share, but in my view, what that does is that that does not recycle good ideas. And it creates an attitude or a view that if I'm elected, I'm elected for life and I'm irremovable. When you have things like term limits, what that does is that that recycles representation. So I know that I could only be in an office for two terms, 10 years, which is a long time. 10 years is a long time. That is the opportunity for me to give my ideas, to work, to devote my energy but after that 10 years I leave and what do I worry about I don't worry about staying there I don't worry about my political party I don't worry about myself I worry about the replacement and the continuity and the legacy of government you worry about ensuring that there is a cycle of leadership that can replenish and can create good ideas what that will do is automatically that will involve itself in more women in elected officials, more young people in elected officials. If I'm in an office for 30 years, that means for 30 years, somebody else can't hold that office. So that those are things I think we need to look at very specifically in terms of how do we create leadership. I have been an election observer in many countries as part of Commonwealth, Commonwealth observation missions. And one thing that I find that's very unusual in Belize, and I've been on four observation missions, and in all four observation missions, the same law existed. 48 hours, in some cases it's 28, 48 hours before the election, you must remove all election paraphernalia. And on election day, the candidates and their supporters stay in their office. In election in Belize, we have tents, we have banners, we have t-shirts. All of that is illegal in other countries because the notion of a vote is that an individual unpersuaded by anything other than constructive campaigning and lawful campaigning would go and cast a vote. So if you want to stay in your bed and sleep on election day, I tell myself, I'll win it out your vote. I don't need it. There should not be any incentivizing of that process. If you need a ride to the election office, 
You call the elections and boundaries department. You do not call a political person because that means that you have a vote for me. And the idea is that you want to make your system of elections transparent and reflective of what it ought to be, which is a selection of who is the best person to lead a particular area or the country. And what I'm saying to you is that this is not rocket science. There are countries in our world that have these laws. There are consultants that have come in to give presentations. There are things that you yourself can look at and observe and realize that, man, that don't make no sense. When you go and vote, this person in a red shirt and this person in a blue shirt, they rush you up and vote for me, vote for me, vote for me, vote for me. And that doesn't exist in other countries. In other countries, election day, very quiet. Very, very quiet. And everybody stays in their house. Of course, you have election monitoring. So the political parties can go in the election area and they can ensure that it's being conducted honestly. There are international monitors, which happens in our elections. So when we have elections, there are independent people from abroad who come in and they can monitor the election so that a candidate should not fear that it's being done in a biased way because there are checks and balances there. It's not conducted by the government, it's conducted by the public officers and international people are there. But on election day, if you're the candidate, stay home. If you are the supporters, stay home. Those are things that you can put in the law. So that one of the things that I would ask of your consideration is that you look at these processes that deal with election. And you look at how those processes could be reformed in the Constitution. There's a growing argument whether or not changes should be reflected in the Constitution or it should be reflected in subsidiary legislation. One of the things that you may want to look at or give your comment or your view on is making it effective. And if I want to make it effective and I want to make it clear, I will spell it out in the Constitution itself. On this issue of, on this issue of the electoral process, it's the issue of campaign finance. We have had a problem with this since independence. And I will not stand here and I will not point any finger at any individual or at any political party. It is just something that we as a society need to deal with. And we need to deal with it proactively. Money must be in politics. And it occurs all over the world. But it has to be regulated. And there has to be adequate oversight in relation to how political parties raise and report money. Because if you have a political party that is getting money, and this is a generic example, if you have a political party that is getting millions of dollars from one person, who will they be loyal to? Will they be loyal to you or will they be loyal to that one person? The point that I'm saying is that my 10-year-old child could say that that is wrong. You want to make sure that the elected official is beholden to the electorate. That the only thing that directs my actions is the voter. And the voter who goes into a ballot box and makes an objective decision based on legitimate campaigning. So that this issue of campaign finance is something that we need to look at. We need to study, we need to reform, and there needs to be laws on it. In other countries, likewise, six months, this is not every country that I've seen, but I've noticed at least one country has this law. Six months before the election, six months before the election, the government cannot have any giving program. They can't. They can't. Six months before the elections, they cannot have a giving program. Because when you get something from the government, that's not the government giving you that. That's your tax dollars that you would pay for it. So why is it that for five and a half years, I don't get nothing, 
and in the six months before the elections, I get this and I'm inundated with things. And in at least one society that I've been to, the law is that within six months of an election, you cannot have any giving program on behalf of the government. I've seen also in a Caribbean country, they have a national housing trust. And I looked at an interview in one of their newspapers because I read their news and they discontinued the practice that when you get a house from this government institution, it's paid for by tax dollars, when you get a house, no politician goes there and gives you the key to your house. That cannot be. You don't get it from no government. You get it from your tax dollars. That is how a system of government works. And so this idea that we will have, and I've seen it happen on both political parties, Darrell Bradley football camp, Darrell Bradley Christmas party, Darrell Bradley this, these are public funds, these are public funds, and these funds must be properly marshaled for public services, legitimately challenged, channeled through the public service. So if I want social services, I go to the Department of Human Services. There's a ministry that does that. There's no reason I should go to any political office for that. There is a ministry that deals with social service and there's a budget that funds that. All of those things are important. The last thing that I want to touch on is this issue of public service reform. I alluded to it in the beginning, but I think that it is very important as an area of reform and dialogue in our constitution so that the public service is an important check and balance on political power and the checks and balance are practical meaning that the public service commission hires a public officer. So you do not apply to any minister or any political person. You apply to the Public Service Commission and they approve and they give you a letter of appointment. They approve you. There was, I believe it was the 10th Amendment to the Belize Constitution, the 10th Amendment. And what the 10th Amendment does is that it says that members who are on these constitutional commissions, members who are on these constitutional commissions, you have to resign or your term of office expires when a new government comes in. That's what the 10th Amendment to the Constitution says, I believe it's the 10th Amendment, that the electoral constitutional bodies, when a new government comes in, those bodies, the members of those bodies resign. That makes absolutely no sense. What that does is that that reinforces the idea that those independent constitutional bodies which are set out in the constitution and which are supposed to be a check and balance on the elected official, they're now beholden to the elected official because when a new government gets in, I appoint who I want. So what I'm saying is that the public service, including the public service commission, needs to be strengthened and it needs to be properly insulated so that it carries out the function of the law. I remember my grandmother used to tell me one thing that they liked about the colonial days, not that we should go back there, but one thing they liked about that was the bureaucracy. I know right now, I'm old, but I'm not that old, but I know public officers. I could call the names of people. My mother, for an example. My mother has been a teacher and a public officer for almost 40 odd years. 40 odd years she spent in the public service. That's what we want in public officers. We want people who will choose to make their public service career a career and they will know that I will be selected by merit 
and I could work all the way to my retirement and I would get my pension. And you want people to go in there based on their education and experience. And you want people to go in there based on merit. And what we have done is that we've eroded that system so that there has to be a process of public service reform. And I've seen this being talked about by multiple political parties and multiple entities, but I've never seen it happen. We need to ensure that the public service is properly protected. One of the ways that we can do so is, I believe that we need to make sure that the public service commission is insulated and that the public service commission is and continues to be an autonomous independent body independent of any control of the executive or the political director there's nothing wrong with the political director there's nothing wrong with that but when they drafted the constitution they recognize that that power has to be protected that's why the separation of powers exists that the power of government is important the power of government is important to be effective in discharging the public will but it is a power that needs to be guarded and protected and so the public service is the implementer of policy that's their job they're part of the executive branch and they implement policy so if i want a passport i go to the immigration department it's a public officer that gives me that if I want education services, I go to a school, it's a teacher that gives me that. If I want healthcare services, or I want um, social assistance, or I want any program of the government, it's a public servant that gives me that. Why? It is because the public service, the goods that you receive, the services that you receive, it is a right that you have as a citizen. It is the purpose of government that government facilitates the process of delivering goods and services. And that process of delivering goods and services itself must be transparent and must be independent and must be autonomous. If I have to go to an elected official for a service of government that's fundamentally wrong because the elected official will say well who you vote for in the last election it is for this reason that we need to make sure and guarantee that the rights of the public service are protected so number one limiting or controlling or protecting the public service commission number two ensuring always that there is no political involvement in any kind of appointments to the public service itself. So things like you have to bring a letter from your area representative. You have to get some sort of nod from the elected officials. All of those things should be expressly outlawed because those things undermine the public service. I would put out there for comment and discussion whether or not we shouldn't even go back to the system of having permanent secretaries so that the whole public service is properly protected and insulated from the head right down. There have been examples in our society where public officers stand up to the elected officials. That is what the Constitution designs. No illegal check is written by any minister of government it is written by the public officer if the public officer stands up and says no and is protected that is the check that the constitution designed one of the things that i am very impressed with in the united states you have this situation with donald trump the president former president and he's charged with interfering with electoral processes and there is evidence that has emerged in the state of georgia 
that he went there and he spoke. He had a telephone call with the Secretary of State. And he said, we need this. We need 11,000 votes. Or can you find 11,000 votes? And you know what moved me in listening to those conversations? The Secretary of State, the public officer, said no. There's allegations that he went to many other people and he asked or suggested or tried to brought pressure and all of those people who were from him, his same political party, the same Republicans, they told him no. They told him that my oath of office is to the Constitution, it is not to any president. And they told him no. The Vice President of the United States, there is allegations that he tried to get the Vice President not to certify the election. The Vice President told him no. You imagine in this Belizean society, if we had a public service that was protected and the minister comes to you and tells you approve this, the minister comes to you and tells you sign this, the minister comes to you and tells you do this and you look at the minister and tell him I swore an oath that I will impartially and objectively discharge my duty as a public officer and no Mr. Minister my duty is to the Belizean people and to the constitution and to the rule of law in this land. I tell you co um, corruption would stop in, an, in a minute because the public service is that fundamental or one of the fundamental checks and balances in the constitution. And if we have deliberate consideration that empowers the public officer, that ensures that public officers are not victimized, because I've seen this happen, that when you stand out, when you try to be a check and balance, when you try to challenge governmental, governmental authority, you may be victimized, you may be fearful. That should never be the case. Whistleblower legislation, legislation that encourages people to come forward and to speak out against abuse. Those are the kinds of laws that we should deliberate on and those are the kinds of laws that we should pass. So that if we look at the public service and we look at it deliberately and talk about ways that we can more protect public officers and make the service more about merit and make it go back to what it was designed for, a person who makes the public service their career, and they are devoted to efficient, effective delivery of services to the public, and they are beholden to the people and the constitution of Belize, we will have a reformed society. Ladies and gentlemen, I will, we're coming to the lunch hour, I was asked to talk for about 11.30, I'm going to just bring the presentation to a close. One of the things that I want to say in closing is that it is very, very important that we recognize the Constitution's importance, but we also recognize that the Constitution is us. That we are the Constitution. The Constitution itself, as what it is, is only a document. It is only words. And the process of this commission and the process of making the report about the Constitution, the process is as important as the outcome. The process is as important. So the process of consultation, the process of meaningful engagement, the process of even argumentation, arguing, because the Constitution talks about who we are as a Belizean people, what are our values, what is our ethos as a people, how do we want to shape and express how our society looks like. And I, for one, would not want somebody else to tell me what I am about. 
our first constitution in 1981 was negotiated and drafted primarily in England. This constitution, led by this chairman and this commission, is an opportunity for the people of Belize to give their stamp on the expression of who we are as a people. And I want to impress upon each and every one of you to use that opportunity. Use that opportunity effectively. Use that voice to be a champion for change. Use that voice to be a facilitator of information and knowledge. Many of you are teachers. I know that the commission cannot get to everybody. But you have about 30 people in your classroom. Raise it with them. You will go home to your staff room and to your family. Raise it with them. Make this discussion, make the consultations meaningful and introspective, a review as to who we are as a Belizean people and how we can be better. How we can draft a constitution that respects and reflects the highest expression of what we want. What rights do we want and what system we want. But that will never happen. It will come to naught unless and until it is on the backdrop of the Belizean people. Until you know what the constitution is, until you know what the constitution does, and until you recognize and embrace that the constitution is about you and your power. So that the idea with the constitution is that it is fundamentally a contract between the people and their state. The people and their state, what kind of society we want. And that constitution must be authored by the people. And so I want to thank all of you for participating in this discussion this morning. I look forward for the question and answer this afternoon. I wanted to just talk a little bit about the structure of the constitution as distinct from the words. You may look at the words but you may put good words, and when that's passed, it's the same thing. You have to look at the structure that is intended and designed by the Constitution, including the system of checks and balances, and how can we make these things more effective in our daily lives. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to extend my gratitude to the chairman for asking me to give my input and comment on the presentation, and I wish you every success in the continued deliberations, and I wish that every person in this room sees themselves as an integral part of this consultation process and this reform process to make our society better. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you were able to take on board uh, what both presenters have shared. Just before I hand over to the mistress of ceremonies, Ms. Rabin, I wanted to have you think about this during lunch, that the point made by both speakers, one, the importance between a citizen and a person and your fundamental rights. And the other thought when you come back in this afternoon is what Mr. Bradley spoke about, structure. And I want to say this. The check and balance we have in our country today, that 13th senator, the marijuana bill, the power of referendum, that 13th senator is only in our constitution because the Belize National Teachers Union took to the streets and beat the streets for 11 days. What Mr. Bradley was trying to say, the people must have their hands on their constitution. And thanks to the government of Belize, we have an opportunity that we've never had in 42 years. So don't look at the messenger, look at the message. And the message is, we are to talk to you, we are to listen to what you say, write down what you say and present it to the Prime Minister by May 
2024. Think about what we have. Look at these structures and listen to the words elected, appointed. Many have said an elected Senate is more effective than an appointed Senate. But if you look at the structure of social partners and the 13th senator, we might erode what we have if you don't understand it. So these sessions are to try to bring on board uh, these discussions that we can effectively then consult with you going forward into the final report to be presented. I would like to now hand over um, to the mistress of ceremonies to explain the process for lunch. Thank you once again. Thank you, Mr. Chanona and Mr. Bradley. For our lunch session, which begins at 11.30, all persons must be seated. If you have no tickets, please register. The white ticket is for drinks and the, the red for food. Tickets must be handed over to get food and drinks. Food will only be brought to those seated. No one person at the food station will be served. Volunteers will come in with garbage bag to pick up your garbage. We shall resume at 1 p.m. sharp. Session will have CPD hours, so you need to register. Filling out the survey is one of the components of the CPD, and the survey is anonymous. If you leave before this forum is over, you must sign out at the gate. I have a set of keys here. A Ford key was left on the table at the, at the entrance. If you're missing your keys, I have a set of keys here.